E30 and Kings Kerswell Road. And also heavy traffic on Alfington Road at the Seven Stars traffic lights. Travel time, we understand, is about five minutes at the moment. Please do let us know if you've got anything to add by calling BBC Radio Devon's travel line. It is a free phone number. You'll be speaking to Jake this afternoon. That's 0808 100 28 29. Pippa Quelch. BBC Radio Devon. The time now is 13 minutes past two. Many of us feel that a trip perhaps to the cinema is a bit of escapism, don't we? A chance to forget our lives just for a few hours in a darkened room with a massive vat of popcorn. <laughs> but you might be surprised to learn that films played a very important part during the First World War for soldiers. Dr Chris Grosvenor is a lecturer in film studies at the University of Exeter and he has just won a national award award for his groundbreaking book Cinema on the Frontline British Soldiers and Cinema in World War One. It's the first study of the wartime use of film to provide entertainment for the troops living through the trauma of the war. Well Chris I'm so pleased to say is with us this afternoon. Chris many congratulations on the award. Thank you very much, Pepper. It's a real pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. <laughs> well the first thing that I did when I knew that I'd be talking to you is um, I googled when was the first film <laughs> because I hadn't actually realised there was anything significant available to watch during the First World War. I think it was 1888 that uh, film first came into being, wasn't it? Around that, 1895-96 is the sort of um, consensus Yeah, but it's still a bit rough, I guess. <laughs> Well, the, I suppose the early films, the one I, I saw was, uh, I think, before 1888, it was Horse in Motion, which wasn't a proper film, was it? And then there was the Round Hay Garden sequence, the oldest known film in existence, sort of sequence-wise. But but proper films, yeah, they, they were around about the, the turn of the century then? Round about the turn of the century, going into the early 1900s, 1910s, when cinemas really became, I guess, what we'd recognise today as cinemas, a place to go to, and as you were just saying, to to escape into for... An hour or two. Mm. So, when the First World World War started in in uh, 1914, uh, films, silent films, I imagine, were really quite popular. Oh, absolutely! Um, at the time, silent films were really sort of making their mark uh, across the world, but certainly in in the UK. And cinemas, as I was saying, were beginning to pop up beforehand. Films had been shown maybe in sort of theatres alongside. Uh, music hall acts and musical performances, that sort of thing. Mm. But around 1910, 1911, these cinemas started popping up uh, just prior to the war. Um, So they were in a good sort of place once the war started um, to, um, you know, provide that entertainment and provide that kind of um, news information, I guess, these early newsreels providing an update about the war. And these films were mainly coming from America? Yes, the American, um, you know, Hollywood as we know it today, the early uh, American industry was definitely uh, one of the most popular um, producers of films at the time. But also uh, we in the UK uh, definitely um, were making our claim in the industry as well as uh, France and Italy and other European countries as well. So are there any films from that time that we might know of now? Maybe less individual films, but I'm sure many people will have heard of particular film stars. So Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Douglas Fairbanks were all either making their way into the the film industry at this point or or had been around for a few years by the time uh, the war broke out in 1914. And uh, directors too. I think Cecil B. DeMille was, was just becoming a director, wasn't he, at that point? Yes, I think that's right around that time, yes. Yeah. I hear, Chris, that it was a photo that inspired your study into this whole subject. Yes. So I was researching something completely different, but I came across this photo of British soldiers setting up a screen and a projector in the middle of a field on or just behind, really, the, the frontline trenches. And I thought, that that's insane. Who are these people who are setting up a cinema in the midst of, of a battlefield? And... I looked into it and found that, you know, rather than being this sort of one-off novelty, it was actually a widespread, very pervasive um, practice to set up these 
soldier cinemas for the British troops. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because, you know, all that we really hear about um, in wartime, you know, in the First World War, uh, it, it, on the front line, uh, is the fighting and, the, oh, just the sheer horror of it all. But d- just imagining what it was like for the troops, you know, uh, um, preparing for, for battle, uh, film clearly was something that was important to them then. Absolutely. So they would often sort of rotate through various jobs, as it were. I think they'd spend around two weeks in the actual frontline trenches themselves, and then they would rotate back into rest camps and billets away from the front line. And it was during that sort of time that they could, I don't know, play sports or go see a musical performance or uh, go drink and enjoy themselves. But the cinema was there as well. And thousands upon thousands of troops um, went to these basically DIY cinemas set up often by themselves to laugh at the antics of Charlie Chaplin or, you know, just sort of be around friends and, and, and comrades. It's that shared experience. We've talked a lot about it on this show. You know, what what makes cinema important, you know, and, uh, you know, an, an occasion. It's, it's other people, isn't it? It's a shared experience that you're all uh, enjoying together. So for them, it really was escapism. Absolutely. I mean, quite literally escapism in the sense that just outside those cinema doors, as it were, they'd often be a sort of barn or a um, abandoned building rather than an actual cinema. But behind those doors would be shell fire and, you know, the, the volley of weapons and the whole hellscape of, of the First World War going on outside. And, you know, these cinemas weren't immune from that. They were shelled. They were damaged. They had to be evacuated. Um, but that didn't stop these soldiers from going along and trying to escape that kind of um, trauma of, of the front line. That's amazing, this idea of soldier cinemas. So they weren't actually in the trenches. They, they weren't able to set up anything that, uh, that, that would be in the trenches. This is just, you know, behind the line, really. Just behind the lines, mm. yeah. Um, often within, say, a couple of miles, maybe a mile of... Um, the actual frontline trenches, no man's land, as we as we talk about it being today, mm. um, but certainly not without, not beyond the reach of of shell fire. And they were able to get hold of the equipment and and, and operate it well themselves. Yes, um, many sort of British formations sort of took it upon themselves to buy equipment and and lug it from the UK. When the the film industry itself, the British film industry, began to realise that film was such a major part of soldiers' lives over there, they themselves would donate um, equipment, be it um, projectors and screens or the films themselves, obviously to try and help boost morale and aid the war effort in a way that they could. And I guess a lot of these soldiers were, were you know, pretty adept at, uh, at working equipment, so it wasn't a problem for them to step in as projectionists. <laughs> no, not at all. And Many, in fact, returned from the conflict and, and took up roles as projectionists and other things in the industry. So it kind of came full circle. You can understand that, can't you? Because they would have associated this with a very positive you know, part of their experience, which must have been really difficult out there. Uh, so you can understand why they wanted to spend, I guess, a lot of their lives working on it afterwards. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And the industry welcomed them with open arms. What about the industry? When it realised that soldiers were, you know, um, making really good use of, of films and uh, and how important they were, did, did the films change in any ways? Not necessarily, but the soldiers themselves were very specific about the kind of films they wanted to watch on the front line. So whereas back home, civilian audiences would be watching not exactly propaganda, but films about the war and its progress and how... Um, you know, the, the forces were doing. Soldiers, they didn't want any of that. They, they were living that day to day. So they wanted the comedies and the, the dramas and even just sort of um, locally set sites of, of London or, you know, the places that they'd grow up and the places that they were fighting for was what was more important uh, to them at that time. And I can't help thinking that, you know, if they had the equipment, uh, you know, their... Um you know, the authorities would have wanted them to have understood sort of messages that they wanted to get across. Was it used at all, you know, uh, to, to share information, these uh, these makeshift uh, soldier cinemas? Not as much as you'd expect. Mm-hmm. Um, I've come across some sources that say that they tried to show them 
these sorts of films, but these soldiers were very canny. They were very um, cynical about the kind of messages that were potentially being sent. And really, rather than you know the army as a, a sort of larger institution, really their their faith was put in those around them, their best friends, the people who they could actually. You know, they were actually sharing space with in these rest camps and billets and, and fighting shoulder to shoulder with mm-hmm. on the front line. That's who they were fighting for, as well as their families back home. So it was less of a tool and more of a morale booster. Absolutely. Yeah. And one that was far more acceptable um, as a morale booster than, say, uh, popping down to um, a local bar or other um, uh, venue. Uh, I, I'll leave your listeners to imagine what I'm referring to here. Um, the military were far more encouraging of 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 this sort of you know wholesome entertainment of cinema sure. rather than potentially other, um, other other ways of passing the time. So, in your research, did you try and find out how many of these uh, cinemas were set up, or uh, you know where they were dotted? Mm. So, my research was focused mainly on the Western Front, so France and Belgium, um, and they were set up pretty much following that front line um, uh, of no man's land uh, as the war progressed. They were set up, as I said, just behind the lines, often in barns, in abandoned buildings, in town halls or just the open air. They were There were dozens of them, um, if not hundreds, set up at any one time. Some were a bit more permanent. They were set up in, a, in an abandoned building. Some actually traveled around the different regiments and formations and visited them with a kind of mobile projector projector um, uh, kit, as it were. It's just painting a, an image of, uh, of the First World War that I'd never, never really even considered before. And that's the thing, because this is a groundbreaking book, as we've been saying. And it can't, Chris, have been a very easy subject to research because so little was mm. known about it. And, and you can't exactly speak to anyone who was there, can you? No, uh, <laughs> yeah, rather... Um, you know, in, com- in comparison to some of my colleagues at, at the University of Exeter, who can actually interview directors or filmmakers or producers, I I couldn't exactly do that. Um, so I went straight to the source and looked at soldier diaries, soldier letters, uh, military documentation, and that was a whole other kind of world to get my head around the, the sort of. Um, military organisation and uh, bureaucracy, I guess. Mm, I heard that uh, some of these were were handwritten military records that were caked in trench mud. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, If if you're aware of the Imperial War Museum up in London, I spent a lot of time there during the the research process and would be reading through these very fragile um, diaries, uh, you know, they, fragile for being around for 100 plus years at this point. Mm. But also, you know, these were on the the, the person, of, uh, they were, you know, in the possession of, of these soldiers as they were fighting and maybe even losing their lives. So, um, yes, very delicate, very, very um, powerful things to read and, and look through. Um, sitting in that sort of archive 100 years on. I see diaries. I always think it are heartbreaking, really, you know, especially if you mm. if, if the, the, there wasn't a very good ending, because this is such a personal account. Did you get to know some of the soldiers then through those diaries? Yes, absolutely. And and you get to know, strangely enough, the, the soldiers' own sort of cinema taste. So I've come across soldier diaries that talked obviously about their love for comedians like Charlie Chaplin and, and uh, Mary Pickford. But at the same time, soldiers who were very dismissive of um, an adaptation of their favourite book that on screen did not do the, the, the novel justice, which I think is kind of conversation we still have today a lot of the time. <laughs> Everyone's a critic, aren't they? <laughs> yes, yes. Even in those circumstances, which is kind of, kind of shocking. It's amazing, though, that no one's really picked up on this as a subject before. You haven't heard of anyone talking about it. No. And, you know, I think when we think back to the First World War, we think of maybe sport. We think of football as being sort of major pastime for the troops. We think of um, musical performances, theatre, um, maybe uh, sort of cynical um, soldier newspapers like the Wipers Times. But no, no one had really written about or researched cinemas and had 
sort of dismiss them as being irrelevant. But hopefully my book sort of um, showed that this was an incorrect assessment. Well, it's it's certainly raised an awful lot of interest. Tell us more about this national award you've just won. Yes, well, I'm I'm very humbled to um, have won this award. It's the Theatre Library Association Award, and it's given to um, works within the fields of uh, performing arts, drama, uh, and recorded performance, which I guess is what cinema and television come under. And it's recognising... Uh, what do they say, exemplary work in the field of recorded performance, which I'm very, very um, amazed and humbled to um, have, have been awarded um, something uh, something along those lines. So uh, a very pleased academic here, and particularly this, this is my first book. Um, so I've, I've hit the ground running. Oh, well, so many speak. congratulations. So, so is the, the second world war to follow? <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe. Possibly, Watch this yeah. <laughs> it could be. Oh, wonderful. Well, it's fascinating to find out more. And that book is available. Is it uh, fairly widely for people to, to get hold of now? I really wish it, I, I could say it was at a reasonable price at all local bookstores. But unfortunately, <laughs> academic publishing is, is slightly more um, uh, expensive, let's say. Sure. But um, one place that you, uh, your listeners could have a read of it if they wanted to, is the Bill Douglas Cinema Museum. Uh, they have a copy there and, and that's open for, for everyone to um, to visit. Well, Phil Wickham very often appears on this show, so we might talk yes. more of it. <laughs> to, to him he'll, about he'll it. definitely like me plugging the show right now, uh, plugging <laughs> the museum right now. So, Of course, definitely. Uh, but that's published, isn't it, by the University of Exeter Press. I'm sure that we can find out more if we uh, we, we uh, get in touch. But uh, Chris, it's brilliant to, to hear about. And uh, well, it certainly opened my eyes today. Thank you so much for, for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. And you, Chris Grosvenor there from the University of Exeter, who's